Greetings and peace. Welcome everyone into this beloved community in this circle today. My name is Ethan Vesley Flad. I am Director of National Organizing and Interim Co-Executive Director at the Fellowship of Reconciliation. I'm so grateful for you joining me today for this special book event with Bishop Mark Andrus um, today, talking about his brand new book, Brothers in the Beloved Community, The Friendship of Thich Nhat Hanh and Martin Luther King Jr. It's a real treat and a pleasure for me to welcome Mark, who I've had the great privilege of knowing for the last couple of decades. We had a really special opportunity to meet one another. I think we'll reference that during the course of our conversation today. This is a conversation that um, I'll be facilitating with Mark um, for a, a period of time. And then we would love to invite your voices as well to join us with some questions and comments. I know that in this circle today, we have people with great histories and legacies of knowledge, um, people who have met and worked with the King family, people who have known and followed uh, Thich Nhat Hanh, Thai, and many others, and that you are teachers in your work and lives, and we are uh, really privileged to share in this conversation with each of you. So thank you for being here today. Um, this is a really a particularly auspicious day, maybe perhaps to be hosting this particular conversation uh, in the week that we honor and remember, especially the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King's life and legacy. Um, it's been quite an uh, uh, extraordinary week uh, with so much shared, I, I know in all of your communities and um, certainly from the King Center in Atlanta and uh, also in the the life and legacy of Thich Nhat Hanh, um, we just learned over the weekend, as I know a few of you did as well, people who were close to Jim Forrest, who was one of um, Thich Nhat Hanh's um, friends and uh, um, colleagues, a, a supporter of his, of his uh, death uh, in the Netherlands. And so we, uh, uh, Jim Forrest, who had previously worked for many years for the Fellowship of Reconciliation in the United States and also as international coordinator or executive secretary of the International Fellowship of Reconciliation just published last year, his um, book, Eyes of Compassion, um, Learning from Thich Nhat Hanh, which is a really beautiful, personal, poignant tribute to Thai's life and leadership. And, and Mark, you, as you know, reference uh, some of his writings in your own book. Um, so um, I know we, we remember him, we remember Bell Hooks, who died quite recently, mm -hmm. and who you also uh, referred to in your book, and so many others. And I know we'll be hearing about that uh, momentarily. So um, as, uh, as we welcome you in, um, Bishop Mark, uh, I, I will say for our audience, um, again, uh, the Right Reverend Mark Andrus is Bishop of the Episcopal Diocese of California, which is the Northern California Diocese of the Episcopal Church. Um, he is a leader within that denomination and ecumenically and in interfaith circles on many issues, particularly on issues of climate justice and environmental um, concern, LGBT, LGBTQIA issue, human and civil rights on a wide range of issues. And um, so we're really honored to have you with us today and to share um, about this book and about uh, really your your many years of work in pursuit of these issues that led you to writing this particular story uh, that is a really one that we've heard in some ways, but are hearing in really new ways through, through your words. So um, uh, I would love to, to invite you in um, now and have you share a little bit a little about what led you to the point of wanting to write this particular story, mm. what, this, this connection, what is the lineage that, that, that brings you here? Well, thank you, Ethan. Well, first, I want to say so great, grateful to be in this space with all of you. And uh, Ethan, especially, uh, I, I love our friendship and uh, you're inviting me into this congregate, this conversation. I, I think you might have been planning to open us with a prayer. Oh, God. I think you're right. Um, and I would love to do that. Um, I just get so caught up in my I know, words and I thinking. Know. So thank you. Um, I, I would love to start us with a prayer from Thich Nhat Hanh as a way of grounding our uh, time and space together. It is titled Recommendations. Promise me this day, promise me now while the sun is overhead 
exactly at the zenith, promise me. Even as they strike you down with a mountain of hate and violence, even as they step on your life and crush it like a worm, even as they dismember, disembowel you, remember, brother, remember, man is not our enemy. Just your pity, just your hate are invincible, limitless, unconditional. Hatred will never let you face the beast in man. And one day, you, when you face this beast alone, your courage intact, your eyes kind, untroubled, even as no one sees them. Out of your smile will bloom a flower, and those who love you will behold you across then thousand worlds of birth and dying. Alone again, I'll go on with head bent, but knowing the immortality of love. And on the long, rough road, both sun and moon will shine, lightening my steps. That, that, that just, no, don't do that. Oh, I did. Amen. Thank you so much, Ethan. Um, and at the end of our session, uh, after questions and um, conversation, I'm going to end us with a prayer from Howard Thurman. Don't keep doing that. Um, which I'm excited about to share with you. Um, so the the opening um, interest you have, Ethan, is how did I get drawn into this book? Yeah. Indeed. So um, long ago, I'm I'm completely honored to see so many radiant people in this um, circle, and I love that you call it a circle. I continue to call these Zoom meeting circles, even though it's so rectilinear and we're all in little boxes, but it feels like a circle um, because of human affection and and love. And I, I've never met uh, you, June Wink, um, but um, long ago, I was the chaplain at an Episcopal boarding school outside of Washington, D.C., and it was there where I encountered the fir first time the works of Thich Nhat Hanh, um, and it's also the only time that I was in the presence of Walter Wink. Um, I took my students. So this boarding school was an all boarding school. Uh, we didn't have any day students. And they came mostly from the American South in those days. It's now, um, I helped create it, uh, turn it into a co-educational school. It had been a boys' school for 150 years. It's a much better school now. <laughs> and um, I, they prided themselves on using the DC as their campus. So every other Wednesday, we had, every other week we had shortened classes on Tuesday and Wednesday. And the buses and vans rolled off the campus and went into D.C. And uh, one day I took my ethics class, uh, who were seniors, into Sojourners. And we had a session with Walter Wink. And it was, I have often wondered to myself, what did those students, how were their lives changed by his absolutely transformative presentation on a portion of um, the Beatitudes, uh, sorry, of the Sermon on the Mount, in which he reinterpreted the whole uh, Christian as a doormat idea of uh, nonviolence, where he took the uh, turn to them the other cheek and uh, give them, them your inner cloak as well as your outer cloak and walk the extra mile and turn those into active nonviolence uh, interpretations. Well, sort of at the same time, so this is 30 years ago, I found Thich Nhat Hanh's book, Peace is Every Step. And it was just such a, um, a bell ringing in my consciousness. I, I loved it. It's a small book, as you know, most of his books are, are small books, very lucid, uh, very simple and very um, powerful. And I carried it around with me on campus. And um, our best friends, uh, Gail and Perry Epps, had um, a beautiful dog, Mariah. She got hold of it and she chewed up the cover. <laughs> it had little tooth marks all over the cover. It had such a big effect as I carried it around the campus. People would see this dog chewed book, paperback, and they would ask me about it. Students would ask me about it. The Latina women working in the kitchen would ask me about it. Faculty would ask me about it. They would say, tell me about this book called Peace is Every Step. I wanna know about this. So that was um, a beginning. And I went that year to National Cathedral to hear Thich Nhat Hanh speak. 
And it was an incredible event for me because uh, National Cathedral is a vast space and it was packed, completely packed. There was not an em empty seat uh, in the pews. And I was up in a balcony, I was way up high and um, there's Thich Nhat Hanh. He's a small person, as you know. And it, he was by himself, seated in the lotus position on a cushion in front of all of us. And we were wrapped for two hours. And he spoke just completely uh, lucidly and beautifully for, for two hours. The next year, I went back to hear him at Washington Hebrew Congregation, also a vast space. Same thing, completely packed. And I'll just say that at that event, I took um, one of my colleagues, uh, Pete Gillen, who um, was a, a teacher and a coach at the school. And several years later, he wrote me to say, um, I know this is a strange request, but for this Catholic boy, he, he was Roman Catholic, uh, to ask an Episcopal priest to do his wedding. And I wrote back, I said, Pete, let me just say that the Episcopal priest took the Catholic boy to hear a Buddhist speaker in a, in a Jewish synagogue. <laughs> I think we can do this. So then uh, years later, in 2001, I was elected the Bishop Suffragan of the uh, Diocese of Alabama, the Episcopal Diocese of Alabama, whose headquarters are in Birmingham. And Sheila and I and our children moved to Birmingham, Alabama. And that is sacred landscape in the civil rights movement. That is sacred landscape. And um, the very center, what here is called diocesan house here in San Francisco, is called Carpenter House in, um, in Birmingham. And Carpenter House is named for Bishop Carpenter, who was the bishop for a 30-year period, which also covered the 50s and 60s of the civil rights movement. And um, he was one of the addressees of the letter from a Birmingham jail. So right there where I worked was um, one of the really touch points of the civil rights movement. And there's a woman, a lay woman named Peggy Roop, uh, who had been a young, she was the um, youth worker for the diocese during that um, very important period. And when I met Andrew Young years later, when he was receiving the Jonathan Daniels Award at uh, Virginia Military Institute, the first thing uh, that Ambassador Young asked me is, how's Peggy Roop? <laughs> and the reason was that even though uh, Bishop Carpenter was negative, uh, or, or he was a gradualist, right? It, it's, we should integrate but not yet. And that, that was part of the occasion of the letter from a Birmingham jail. Peggy uh, invited, without the bishop's knowledge, uh, civil, civil business leaders and civil rights leaders into the bishop's office to meet together. Um, and it, Andrew Young said she was the most important civil rights worker in Birmingham at the time, this young white woman, really interesting. So I just got, I felt it was an invitation for me to, to immerse myself more deeply in racial reconciliation and to learn more. And I started doing uh, racial reconciliation work down in what's called the Black Belt, and especially in Lowndes County. So Lowndes County is the county where, um, Jonathan Daniels was martyred uh, in 1965, uh, saving the life of the great Ruby Sales. And I got to know Ruby, I got to know John Lewis, I got to know all these people. It was just such an incredible privilege to be drawn into this deeper circle of the civil rights movement uh, and its history and its present incarnation. And it was at one of the pilgrimages, the last one I hosted, uh, the Jonathan Daniels and Martyrs of Alabama pilgrimage in August of every year, that I had invited a Representative Lewis to come as, and be the preacher. And in his fantastic address, he talked about the beloved community. And that's the first time I had heard the term. And that was 2006, and that's when we moved when I was elected Bishop of California and we moved here. And uh, again, the resonance, uh, this term beloved community, I had no idea what it meant, but it seemed so powerful to me. 
And so I brought it with me to the Diocese of California. And I said, we need to learn how to manifest the beloved community. And we need to learn what does that mean? So Thich Nhat Hanh, Martin Luther King Jr., I had these two figures prominently in my consciousness, but I didn't know they knew each other until I was in a course at CIIS where I did my PhD uh, with Drew Dellinger. And you all know Drew. Um, and he did his PhD on the cosmology of Martin Luther King. And in that course, he said they knew each other and they had this association. And, and I, uh, when I tell people that who don't know, I had the same reaction on my face that they have is I just light up. So there are millions and millions of people who love both these people. And then when they learn that they are, were together, it's, it's like something goes off inside of us and it opens up. Um, okay, so there, there's the story. That is really so beautiful and amazing. And I know, I mean, certainly, as we were saying just before, um, the circle opened up um, when we met uh, in that Peace Garden in Minneapolis mm -hmm. and started talking. At that time, you were fairly new in that position in Alabama mm -hmm. that you spoke to, and you really graciously invited me to come as soon as I could to join you there for uh, one of those um, Jonathan Myrick Daniels and Martyrs of Alabama Peace Pilgrimage pilgrimages. And in fact, for me, it was uh, one of the first two things that I did, I think, when I uh, came to the Fellowship of Reconciliation was join you that August in 2005. So you've been holding them for a couple of years at that point. And I, I will never forget that experience, which was, you know, so many, it was, it was I think, young people from around the world who had yes. come in 2005. And the elders who were sitting in the midst of the mm -hmm. circle it was incredible. Well, indeed, Ruby Sales and Dr. Vincent Harding. Yes. Um, and so that experience for me was just a really profound one. And I think it really grounded me in this language that you've offered us of sacred landscape um, mm -hmm. uh, and, and what it really meant to be walking and sitting and talking and, and holding space in this place where the Southern Freedom Movement for Black Liberation um, uh, was so uh, was surrounded everywhere you were. Um, um, so it was really quite powerful. Um, and, um, and I thank you for that. And, and it, it, I think one of the things out of that experience that, that evokes for me and really is tied to what you share in this book is this context of lineage that, that you mm -hmm. offer us yeah. in, in, in ways related to both, um, uh, both Thich Nhat Hanh and, and Dr. King's, uh, experience of what brought them to the place that they were and what they uh, sought to bring on. So I wonder um, if you could speak uh, to this framework of lineage and what it means in each of their spiritual traditions and how they, uh, how it came together in the, mm -hmm. in the story. You know, the, the idea of calling this lineage has, has captured some people's imaginations. And I think the reason is that um, trying to link the thought of Josiah Royce, who coined the term beloved community, with um, the Fellowship of Reconciliation founders, and then all the way on up to Thich Nhat Hanh has been difficult to do through a scholarly uh, path, right? Uh, in other words, where's the documentary link that shows from Royce to Musty? I mean, that's the real first question, right? There isn't one as far as I know, uh, as far as anybody knows, to my knowledge, uh, there's not one. And then I started to think, is that the most important thing, the documentary link, or is it the link of transmission? And then I thought that's how a Buddhist would talk about it, is transmission and the lineage of transmission from one living being to another, the flame of one's heart to another, to, to light another flame or to meet and intensify a flame that's already there. And that became a much more fruitful way to trace the path of the beloved community from Royce to Musty, from Musty to Thurman, from Thurman to King, from King to Thich Nhat Hanh. And as I argue in the book, from Thich Nhat Hanh to, to all of us. Uh, Thich Nhat Hanh has the idea, two things, that Maitreya Buddha, 
the Buddha of the future will not be a single person, but rather the Sangha, the community. And he also, like the Dalai Lama, has said that he is not um, having a direct successor. Uh, so uh, slightly different, the, the Dalai Lama has said he will not reincarnate again, but um, Thich Nhat Hanh has said he's not designating a single person to follow him. If you take these two ideas together and think about transmission and lineage, I, I present the idea that perhaps he's giving this lineage to all of us uh, in a way that is, is um, a little more opening. Uh, than, than in the past. And um, so what does each lineage holder in Buddhism do with what they have received? Uh, it's a little bit like tradition in any, in any religious or spiritual community. You hold on to that which is essential, but you also meet the reality of the present moment. And that reveals new things about the tradition. So each one of these lineage holders, I, I present the idea that they, each one has uncovered new aspects of the beloved community that we didn't understand beginning with Royce, right? So um, uh, Thurman brought his own understandings. Um, Musty brings nonviolence uh, first into the work. Um, yeah, each one of them. And uh, I, I have to say, in some ways, Thich Nhat Hanh is the most revolutionary um, of the lineage holders uh, in terms of how much he's revealed about the true nature of the beloved community um, in that uh, he includes the whole earth. So the, the community of the beloved community is not just the human family, it's the family of all life. And he does this in interesting ways by um, applying the name, um, the title Bodhisattva to various entities who have not traditionally in Buddhism been recognized as Bodhisattvas. Like a Christian, um, <laughs> Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, he told him, he told um, Martin in Geneva in 1967, just a few months before Martin's assassination, in Vietnam, we call you a great Bodhisattva. Well, that's quite a statement, right? Uh, he, Sister Chang Khan, who's his longest living, closest associate, who's in Hue, right next door to where Tai is now, he called her a great bodhisattva. Well, um, a living woman as a bodhisattva is not a, a normal thing in Southeast Asia Buddhism. Um, you know, the Buddha's mother is a bodhisattva, but she's like a myth figure, right? But a, a living, breathing human woman as a bodhisattva, you know, that's something. He calls the son a bodhisattva, a great bodhisattva. So each time he does that, he's expanding our understanding of what the beloved community is. He's also worked, uh, you know, since the 60s on gender equality. And I think this is uh, another aspect of the beloved community that we need to sort of take on board, that this is uh, also part of it. Uh, so he started ordaining women in the 60s, and he's continued. When I went to Vietnam to, to be in his presence in the spring of two, 2019, um, there was a young nun, I think she's probably 17 or so, in the community, the convent next door to where he is, and she said to me, uh, I am honored to be in, taking part in a revolution that Thai is conducting without words. And what she means by that, of course, after his stroke in 2014, he can't speak, he can't walk, he can't write, and yet he continues to spiritually lead this community at age 95 now, it's, it's extraordinary. And they are, they feel his leadership and they're still, still developing under his leadership. Uh, so environment, um, uh, gender equality, um, there's, there are many ways that he's kind of expanded what we understand about the beloved community. There are so many pieces I'd love to uh, open up uh, even more here. And let me start with, just, I mean, again, you naming some of those extraordinary 
figures, uh, Josiah Royce and his um, creation of the beloved community. I'll say for the record, actually, for, for the, the context of this particular gathering and conversation, um, there, uh, as I think you know, um, Brother Mark, um, they're all over the internet. I think maybe you referenced this in the book. It says that Josiah Royce not, not only founded, uh, created oh, yeah. <laughs> language, but founded the Fellowship of Reconciliation. So I, the one correction I'm going to make here is it is to disabuse people of the notion that yeah. Josiah Royce founded FOR. Um, and actually, we don't like like your point about kind of trying to find the scholarly, uh, the research and all that. I, I have not found... A, a, an exact record that shows that Josiah Royce was a member of FOR. Uh, I, I, no I think, record at all. So he, I think he died in 1916, as you noted, and FOR USA had been founded just a few months earlier. But with that as context, as you as you note, the the, the transmission of the uh, to uh, Reverend A.J. Musty uh, and Reverend uh, Dr. Howard Thurman, mm -hmm. who were so core to the framework of this fellowship's uh, movement and, and work in, in the 19 teens and 20s and 30s and beyond uh, for decades and who influenced so many is extremely profound. Um, and I, I was really interested, I would, so I would wonder if you'd just um, open us up a little more in terms of the framework of beloved community. Mm. I believe you talk about how Josiah Royce had one context that was really different, again, from where it comes to with Dr. King um, later on, who, who again, we, we credit with so much of the framework, that the notion of it being, um, I believe you say that Josiah Royce really saw it as a dynamic a framework of movement and so forth, and Dr. King saw the beloved community more as an endpoint. And so if, if you would That's uh, clarify yeah. that and, and, mm -hmm. and just say where you, uh, I, I know that we're going to come more to to Thich Nhat Hanh's um, teachings around it as well. Well, so a little tiny bit about Josiah Royce. Um, I think it's interesting. It's interesting to me. Uh, his parents were Cornish um, from England, and they had come to the gold rush uh, to Grass Valley, California. And I, I mean, what's interesting to me about that, besides that I live here, <laughs> and you know, I, I absorb as much as I can about uh, our home here for the last 16 years, is that um, so much was in terms of white uh, culture was new, right? The University of California was not even 20 years old when he went there as an undergraduate. Uh, the community he lived in, Grass Valley, was a new community. He went to um, Johns Hopkins for his PhD. He was one of the first four people to receive a PhD from that relatively new school. And then he ends up as a professor at, um, at Harvard. And at Harvard, uh, this, this Westerner uh, who had, he formed great deep friendships, but he had real struggles in his life. A lot of, um, they lost a child, he and his wife, there was um, a lot of struggle. And uh, he was kind of isolated in some ways. Uh, William James was his greatest friend, but also um, a critic at times. And they, they well, like great friends uh, who were intellectuals, they clashed on some things. Anyway, in 1913, Royce wrote this book called The Problem of Christianity. And I think this is uh, important uh, because it's not only the source of the term beloved community, but the framework, as you say, Ethan, uh, is interesting. So why did he call it the problem of Christianity? Two reasons. He's looking forward and he's actually predicting the avalanche of technological innovation that was about to happen. It was already deeply underway with the Industrial Revolution only a few decades old. But what he saw was what we see looking back as um, where has so much of our technological innovation taken place in the context of war? And what he was looking at was the, the dawn of World War I. Uh, this is written in 1913, as I said. And so he sees this as an ethical problem. Like this technological innovation is gonna happen, but who's going to evaluate it? Who's gonna to respond to it morally and ethically? And then he says, okay, that's a, that's a question. And then he says, the churches are in a, a worse position to respond to this than they were 
a hundred years before. I would say worse and better. So what he is saying is that they have been unseated from power. So the churches were no longer no longer had the same kind of secular power that they had had in the past when they had armies, when they had um, power within the so-called secular government. Um, they'd also been broken up with the Protestant Reformation. There's there's many voices. So if today we we seek to speak as a Christian voice, well, what is the Christian voice? There is not one. Evangelicals will have one voice and Roman Catholics another and, and so on. So he sees that we're going to have this gigantic challenge of a technological innovation and a, a um, fractured and weakened Christian presence uh, or religious presence. He was a Christian, but he was speaking more broadly. So what he did was take key concepts that he saw in the New Testament, in the words of Jesus and in um, St. Paul's works, and translate them into um, philosophical concepts. And one of them is beloved community, which comes from the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God. So if, if any time you look at kingdom of heaven or kingdom of God in the New Testament and translate it into beloved community, that's what you're talking about. And I think it's a transformative practice. Um, so, you know, let's get away from kingdom language, A, <laughs> and B, talk about it as beloved community. That, that's, that opens us up. Um, and if we think about the, the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and how they narrate the beginning of Jesus's ministry, now you remember this. So John the Baptist is arrested by Herod and shut up in prison, as the King James Version says. And immediately after that, Jesus withdraws from the Jerusalem area and goes to the Galilee, and he begins his ministry. And he, in every one of these gospels, he begins by healing and teaching and proclaiming the nearness of the beloved community. Now, that's, a, that's an amazing idea. It's central. It's central to the work of Jesus of Nazareth. Uh, so this is what, uh, but, but I, um, Royce put it in a complex of thoughts. It didn't stand alone. A reconciliation is in it. Um, uh, and uh, so this stays with it all the way up through King. So every time King mentions the beloved community, he almost invariably mentions reconciliation and nonviolence. So he says that on the other side of nonviolence, on the other side of reconciliation, there lies the beloved community. So you've got a dynamic um, that's implied uh, from Royce all the way forward. Really fascinating. And, and, so taking that, as you say, said a moment ago, uh, onward to Tai, to, to his teaching, which expands it then in, in many different directions in terms of bringing in uh, earth consciousness in a, in a particular way, and, um, and especially uh, the, the gender equality piece. And I, I really appreciated how um, uh, you name uh, Thich Nhat Hanh's work to really focus from an early point in his uh, in his uh, um, time as a teacher, as a Dharma teacher, to a, a fuller a, a fuller embracing of uh, 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 multi gender and uh, bringing women into leadership and ordaining women at a point when that was really dramatically against. Uh, 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 in Southeast Asia, what was happening uh, in most of the Buddhist lineages. You also named gender equality in some of your uh, writings about civil rights period as well. And you yeah. really lift up. I mean, it's interesting for a book, again, that is focused on Dr. King and Thich Nhat Hanh. You, you bring in Fannie Lou Hamer and, and um, Ella Baker, uh, Ella Baker and, and Rosa Florida Parks Martin. and Coretta, of course, and her extraordinary leadership as an activist and, and so forth. So um, uh, I, I think... Could, could you talk some more about um, uh, Thich Nhat Hanh's then expansiveness um, and how does his framework around beloved community, uh, you, you talked about bodhisattvas and is it, uh, do they overlap in that way? How, how do they come together in terms of his notion of bodhisattvas? Yeah, um, so 
Dr. King many, many times uh, talked about the inner interconnection of life, the interrelated quality of reality um, from the from the letter from a Birmingham jail forward, uh, 1963 forward. Um, and what Thich Nhat Hanh brought maybe most profoundly to our understanding of the beloved community is, is more than what I've already said. And it is what we might call interpenetration. So interconnection is one thing and interpenetration is another thing. So this is a, this is a big deal. Um, <laughs> what I mean by this is if you take the metaphor of Indra's net um, and um, let's see, I can quickly show you uh, a representation of Indra's net on my background filter. <laughs> There we go. Yeah, so that's one artist's picture of Indra's net. And let me tell you about Indra's net if you're not familiar with it. It's a, it's a fragment of a myth from Buddhism and Hinduism in which Indra, the great uh, god of the uh, storms and clouds and uh, lightning, uh, Indra has a net. And that net is as, is as big as the universe. So it's coextensive with the universe. And as with all nets, the ropes of the net cross. And at those interstices, there's a jewel. And every jewel, so, so that the, the ropes are the interconnection. So Dr. King talked about interconnected. Life is interconnected. You and I are connected to each other. So you could just think of a, a, a string between each of us, a rope between each of us. But then the, the metaphor of Indra's net takes us further because at that interstice, uh, there is a jewel. And in the jewel are reflected all the other jewels of the net. So that's interpenetration. The whole is totally present in all the parts of the whole. And this is not a new concept and it's not, of course, um, exclusive to Buddhism or to India. It's uh, Maximus the Confessor uh, in the sixth century. Uh, this is something the West has understood too, but, but it was not um, to the fore in the thinking about the beloved community, which was about we are connected to each other. But the idea that the whole universe is in each of you and in, each of, and in me, uh, this was a, another aspect. So in 2014, just before his stroke, uh, Thich Nhat Hanh, uh, as you've heard me say, said this, the day that Martin was killed, I was devastated. I could not eat, I could not sleep, and I made a deep vow to continue what Martin called the beloved community. And then he goes on to say, and I, have, I believe I have kept that vow to this day, and I have always felt his support. So that was a very potent statement, and it, it set my mind uh, thinking, and I thought, I need, this, these are the research questions that I need to answer. What does it mean to, keep, to maintain the beloved community? Okay, there's that. Then what does he mean, how would he say he kept that vow over those 40 years? How did he keep that vow? And then what does he mean that he always felt his support? If I've lost a loved one, I may say that I feel her or his support if I go back and read something they've written, or if I bring to mind memories that, uh, that of times that we shared together, right? But in, um, but in Roman Catholicism, in Eastern Orthodoxy, in the Anglican world, we actually think about um, people accompanying us still, uh, saints still being able to help us. And this is the idea of the Bodhisattva. The Bodhisattva is a, is a being who has uh, so far awakened uh, that they could leave, and, and Thich Nhat Hanh has a lot to say about uh, erroneous uh, understandings of nirvana within Buddhism itself, but, but in an erroneous understanding, you could leave this round of birth and death because of your enlightened state and move on. <laughs> but the Bodhisattva makes a vow to stay with this world until all of life is liberated. And um, so what does that mean? 
what does it mean to stay with this world? Well, it means exactly that, uh, that the energy of the Bodhisattva transcends mortal death and continues with this world to give us help. So David Hartsov is a person all of you know, um, and I was at this honoring for David at USF. I was one of the people who spoke at that. And David talked about when it was his time to talk, he talked about feeling um, Dr. King's hand on his shoulder years after King's assassination. And I thought, that's it. That's exactly what I've, I've been reading about in Thich Nhat Hanh's work about the action of the Bodhisattva. They don't leave us. They stay with us. So that's one thing. Uh, but then if you ask the question, how did Thich Nhat Hanh keep this vow? Well, when he went back to Vietnam in 2018 to live, um, his final move, uh, essentially, uh, Time magazine had a little article about him leaving and going back to Vietnam, and it, it's titled something like, The Monk Who Taught the World Mindfulness Has Gone Home. Okay, so that's how most people know him. They don't know his piecework in Paris. They don't know his environmental work. They don't know, certainly don't know his gender equality work. They don't know any of that. They don't know his work with the Vietnamese boat people. They know that he taught them mindfulness. So let's just take, just suppose for a moment that that's what he meant. That not excluding any of that other work, but that teaching people to nurture the inner life through mindfulness might be how he kept his vow to maintain the beloved community. So let's connect that to Dr. King's work. In the letter from a Birmingham jail, he's writing to these you know, this group of white clergymen in Birmingham. And he tells them how they planned nonviolent actions. And the number two step is what in some places he calls purifying, purifying our motives or purifying our consciousness. And by that, he means that before a, a big nonviolent action, which was going to test them, you know, like, truly test them, they worked on their own motivations to ask, why am I doing this? Am I doing this for revenge? Is it a reversal in power? Do I want to throw these bastards out so that I can become the powerful one? Um, no, we need to do this for the purposes of love only. And, and so this purifying the inner world is the work of mindfulness in, in terms of being nonviolent inside so that we can also act nonviolently. Now that inside outside is a fiction, you know, in this very framework, it's a fiction, but it's a convenient fiction for the purposes of understanding what Thich Nhat Hanh is saying. So I think that the inner penetration, the idea that the whole is present in each part of the whole leads us to understand that the beloved community work can take place when you sit in prayer when you sit in mindfulness, that you're doing beloved community maintenance or repair or manifestation in, in that work, as well as in your work as a social activist. Thank you so much. Um, really deep stuff. And I, I want to invite now, as we come into the audience portion of the uh, conversation, um, everyone here, again, we know we have such great knowledge and I see some of that being shared in the chat um, with different comments and questions. Um, we'll bring in at least one of those um, off the chat in the next couple of minutes. I'm going to offer one more um, a question building on some of your, uh, your comments, um, Bishop Mark. Um, and then if, if you'd like to ask a question live in this space, we welcome that. Please use the, there is a functionality where you can raise your hand uh, using that uh, feature in the reaction section, or you can just put your name into the chat to say you'd like to ask a question or, or type something into the chat. And we'll try to include as many as possible um, over the next uh, 20, 25 minutes. Um, we're able to extend our time to get today with with Mark um, into the hour and, and obviously leave when you need to, but I hope everyone can stay for as much of this as possible. Um, uh, so, boy, um, I think what I wanna focus in on right now is again, you're offering us so much in terms of 
um, the earth consciousness and cosmology. And, and you, you reference again in the book, some of the, the many different writers, thinkers, teachers with whom you've um, been in conversation and draw upon their work. Um, Joanna Macy, Brian Swim, um, David Corton and others. Um, mm. And, and I, I was grateful again, of course, with FOR, and which is which you lift up throughout the course of the book, and how FOR interplays with these uh, two stories and their interweaving. You you know you note uh, in 1970 and 71 that Thich Nhat Hanh um, founded, along with Alfred Hassler of the Fellowship of Reconciliation, um, a, a project, an initiative called Dai Dong. Um, uh, a great healing uh, for the earth that, that was brought to the United Nations and, and that commitment for the half century since to be um, strong and resolute. And it's been really so much a part of your own uh, continuing work as well. I know that just a few weeks ago, you were coordinating uh, a delegation to the UN Climate Summit in, in Glasgow. Um, and um, so uh, do you want to talk about how this has uh, this these teachings have informed your own framework then uh, around um, the around climate justice and um, the commitment to to do that um, in and above what you've already said? Um, hmm. Well, that's a beautiful question, uh, Ethan. So I I do have this great sense of gratitude to Thich Nhat Hanh uh, as I enter that um, UN space, uh, beginning with the Paris Agreement in, in 2015, uh, that he really did launch this with a, a seminal a germinal con conversation with Uthant, who was the Secretary General at the time in 1970-71, to say, you need to have the UN is the right body to host a, a, a global conversation uh, work on, on the environment. And I feel like, you know, I'm, I'm stepping into that space with so much gratitude. Um, the other thing I would say about that is his beautiful um, little book, Love Letter to the Planet, is so, um, it is so beautiful. It just, it, it makes me weep uh, with the beauty of it. And I do think this is something we need to grasp in the, um, in the environmental, in the climate change space is people are not converted by facts. We need the science, we absolutely need the science, but they, but people don't change their minds uh, on the basis or their actions on the basis of those facts. We just know that. Um, so the arts have to be forward. <laughs> Narrative has to be forward. Uh, uh, the heart has to be forward. And, and I think that Thich Nhat Hanh's book uh, shows us a way. Um, uh, it's so beautiful that it can draw you into it. And the way I ask people about this is, have you ever had an experience of wonder in your life that's not mediated only by the human community? So, you know, not, not a sense of wonder I mean, those are important when you fell in love for the first time with another person. That's all important. But, um, but leave that aside for a moment and ask, when have you had an experience of wonder that was um, occasioned by, um, by another being other than a human? And it, generally, these fall into three categories, right? Uh, to the macro category, you looked at something in the cosmos, maybe through a telescope or just looking up at the night sky or you saw a comet or, um, you know, I don't know. And, uh, or at the human scale with another creature who's on our sort of scale level or at the microbiological scale, um, like looking through a microscope instead of through a telescope. And I, I tell this story, <laughs> I asked that question in Alabama once um, with our council, the diocesan council, and this wonderful woman from Montgomery, who was in her 60s at the time, said, I have a story. And I said, what is that? And she said, um, when I was in fourth grade, I looked through a microscope for the first time. And I think what she saw was a paramecium. I can't remember exactly. It was either Volvox or a paramecium. And it was a live, it was a live a slide, right? And this, this microscopic uh, organism moved across the slide and she said it was so beautiful and so unexpected that I fainted 
<laughs> and she fell out of her chair <laughs> in her in her classroom. Um, and uh, so then when you ask that question, when have you had an experience of wonder? Then the other thing I like to say about that is what we love, we will protect. So once you identify um, that you have had an experience of wonder is falling in love. It's the, it's a step of falling in love. Um, and once you've had that experience uh, and you remember it, you start to go, yeah, I'm committed to that being, to, to maybe the system that being lives in, the ecology of that system. I will do something to help survive that, that being survive. Uh, you know, so we start with wonder uh, as, as a form of love. And then we move from there to uh, solidarity with, with that uh, creature or with that being. And yeah, for instance, there's a young uh, Episcopal priest in the LA area and he's a surfer. And he says, if you want to see how badly the earth is being battered, uh, it's certainly bad on the land, but you should look beneath the surface of the waters because it's worse there. And uh, because he surfs uh, virtually every day, he, he's fallen in love with the ocean and the life in the ocean. And he's deeply committed to, um, to protecting that which he sees as, as so imperiled. Beautiful. What we love, we will protect. Um, I mean, I think it, I was going to ask you a question about hopefulness, given the work around climate, which is such this area of tension around hope and despair and so forth. And you've offered us something Right there, I, I do want to bring in some of the uh, uh, wonderful folks we have here in the circle mm -hmm. now. And it's um, one question that we're going to start us out with off the chat um, is, uh, is is from someone um, you've probably worked with in, in your uh, deep relationship to the UN and uh, environmental work, Richard Jordan. Um, yes, dear, dear, thank brother, you. dear brother Richard. That's good. To, good to see you again um, after so long. Um, and it's amazing that we've had this conversation for so long, and I don't think we've even talked about this extraordinary thing that you've named it. Maybe I missed it of Dr. King nominating um, uh, for the for the Nobel Peace Prize um, the year after he received it. Uh, maybe you did, and I just overlooked it. But it but that would that is such an extraordinary part of their story, and and, mm -hmm. and I think you name in the book again. Um, like people might think of it as, oh, just an easy thing to do, but kind of how unique that was, uh, right. given the lineage of what was happening at that point. And I think that year, the Nobel Peace Committee didn't give out a Nobel uh, Peace Prize. And, right. and 1967. 1967. So, so maybe you could speak to that and take Richard's question, which is, are prizes such as the Nobel Peace Prize or the Templeton Prize mm -hmm. other forms of bodhisattvas, which I think is... Oh, wow. Well, that's... That's a that's a fascinating question, and um, I'll have to think about that one, Richard. But as to the to Martin nominating Ty for the sixty seven Peace Prize, um, I do make an argument in the book that I haven't seen advanced other places, and I think it's I think it's a powerful thing. Um, if you Google Thich Nhat Hanh, Martin Luther King, you will see hundreds, if not thousands, of um, websites that just say that. That's all they say, um, that King nominated Ty for the 67 Peace Prize. That's it. If you dig a little deeper, you will hear, and, and I can think of one person in the international uh, climate work that I do who believes, says this very openly, um, King made a mistake. This is how he put it. King made a mistake by making an open nomination, that is a public nomination of Ty, because uh, these are closed nominations. Uh, he, King was eligible to make a nomination. I'm not eligible to make a nomination. Most of you are not eligible to make nominations. Certain academics can make nominations and, and laureates can make uh, nominations, former recipients, uh, but, but, and, and certain people in high government positions can make nominations but most of us can't make nominations. So he was eligible, but they're supposed to be um, an, a, a private nominations. So the presumption people have made is that by making a public um, nomination, King basically disqualified Ty from receiving him. I think that's a mistake. 
Um, and the evidence I have is the letter from a Birmingham jail and other places where an open letter, uh, like uh, the open letter that Ty wrote to King about the self-immolations of monks and nuns, like the open letter that King wrote nominating Ty for the uh, Peace Prize, they are forms of what King called raising the tension. Now, this is a very important idea. Right now, when voter rights are being swept away across the United States and, and organizations like FOUR are just continuing their work, uh, that we, we must think about this technique of raising the tension. King got it from, of all places, Plato. <laughs> and uh, when Plato writes his description of um, as if it's first person uh, of uh, Socrates's defense. So Socrates is put on trial for his life. He's convicted by the citizens of Athens and he's, he's executed. In his defense, he calls uh, Athens a, a well-bred but sluggish <laughs> horse. And that horse uh, needs a gadfly, a horsefly, literally, to bite it, to wake it up and bring it back to its better self. And King says, I am that gadfly. <laughs> and Socrates was that gadfly. And what he's saying is we need to be like that. We need to raise the tension. So I think his nomination of Ty was um, raising the tension on the Nobel Peace Prize Committee in the middle of the Vietnam War. Right. So if they gave this prize to a Vietnamese uh, monk who had been exiled by both the North and the South and represented a country at war with the most powerful country on Earth, um, this would have been a difficult position for them to be in in some ways. And what King is saying is show a little moral courage. <laughs> and of course, they did not. Uh, just as most of those white clergymen in Birmingham did not respond to King's letter. Uh, one of them changed his life as a result of that. Uh, a few years later, he, he really became a, um, um, a race advocate, uh, a civil rights advocate, but most of them didn't. And by raising the tension, the rest of us who witnessed this, it's changing us. Right. To see this is actually the, the point is maybe you might say it is more the bigger point is not the people who are the addressees of the letter, but everybody who looks over their shoulders reading it. Uh, it's for us. Um, great. Um... Yeah, I think I mean you, you you name that so well with the letter from Birmingham jail, as you say, and and. And indeed, uh, I think I want to stick with that period in terms of a couple of questions that have been posed in the chat. Um, and again, yeah. please, everyone, continue to offer uh, questions that you might have um, in that space or raise your hand. Um, we have from um, my friend Shelby Van Sickle um, joining us from Toronto, um, uh, a question and then one from my colleague Susan Smith. I'm going to offer them to you together. They, they kind of... Okay represent different ways of thinking about that period when they met only twice, as you've named. It was just yeah. two times that they, mm -hmm. and it was briefly, really, right, uh, that they yeah. sat together in Chicago. Two hours each time. Yeah, uh, and then Geneva, as you named earlier. Um, and so um, Shelby asks, um, and this is really, this would be hypothesis, conjecture, I think, you know, like, can you offer thoughts about what Thich Nhat Hanh's Hans um, ministry, how it might have looked or been shaped had he not had that direct relationship with uh, Reverend Dr. King, and um, and and maybe you can name that in terms of you know a couple of the other things that would have happened or, or otherwise I don't know, but um, and and Susan um, asked the question um, in terms of his uh, beyond his extraordinary beyond Vietnam speech on April fourth of nineteen sixty seven. Now I, I started out. Our, our program today by offering this prayer from Thich Nhat Hanh, which is what, like the letter that the open letter again that he writes to King, you know, is so it's both so poignant and 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 filled with 
love and humanity, and at the same time, brutal and painful and right. uh, uh, framework in that way. And so, to what extent? I mean, I think there's a. I think you suggest that uh, in his speech that he doesn't name Thich Nhat Hanh, but sort of unnamed monk, unnamed monk. So he kind of identifies him in that way. Um, uh, what would you s say about those kind of connections again and these questions that were asked? You mean about their influence on each other? Yeah, yeah. Uh, both the influence that I think you you pretty clearly state is there in that speech on, on oh, and, yeah, yeah, yeah. The church. So and maybe yeah, for go ahead. Han, and maybe for Thich Nhat Hanh the other way, maybe mm -hmm. if they hadn't met, uh, can you can you suggest what might have looked different in terms of his life in this? Well, I'll start with that first piece, which you named again at the end, uh, the influence of, of Martin on Thai. Um, so when Thai was young, um, those immolations were not peace protests. They were not about the war per se. They were about religious oppression in Vietnam um, by the Roman Catholic Vietnamese, South Vietnamese government. So um, the president of uh, South Vietnam's brother was the first uh, South v Vietnamese archbishop cardinal in the Roman Catholic Church. And um, the oppression of um, Buddhists by that government uh, was the occasion of uh, Thich Quang Duc's self-immolation and several of the ones that followed. So um, Thich Nhat Hanh's experience of Christianity was quite negative uh, as a young person. And he was fearful about Christianity. And it was uh, Daniel Berrigan and um, Thomas Merton, among others. But most of all, Martin Luther King Jr., who taught him to not fear Christianity and, and to love Christianity. As he has said, and I love this uh, of his quotations, it's one of my favorites. He said that um, he believes he knows Jesus and Buddha better than many people who lived on the earth with them during their lifetimes on the earth. Why? Because he visits them every day. So I just love that. Um, and the idea that he would do that, it would have been unimaginable before he met these um, compassionate avatars of Christianity like David Stindl Ross and uh, Thomas Merton and Daniel Berrigan and, and Martin Luther King Jr. He, he says he is the main one who taught him the warmth of Christianity, the compassion of Christianity, the courage of Christianity. So look at all the things that have come out of that. Uh, Jesus and Buddha as brothers, the, uh, you know, two books by Thich Nhat Hanh on Jesus and Buddha, his writings about the Eucharist, his writings about prayer, all of this, um, you could say, stems from his friendship with, um, with Martin Luther King Jr. So a huge influence, really. And I would say that in the last hundred years, there's not a uh, Buddhist teacher of, of the Dharma as, as prominent as, um, as Thai who has so deeply and sympathetically explored Christianity as Thich Nhat Hanh. And you could say that, again, you know, stems from his friendship um, with Martin Luther King Jr. Um, so the influence the other way, I suppose, is the other way to talk about that. Uh, so... Um, Dr. King was already analyzing the Vietnam War before he received that letter from Thai about the immolations. And he was, he was analyzing it through the lens of race and, and income inequality, right, and rights. And he saw that, you know, just in the simplest terms, that uh, this, this war highlighted and exacerbated the inequalities uh, for black people in the United States, in that it was perfectly fine for them to serve in Vietnam, uh, lose limb and life. But if you lived and came back to this country, you came back to the same prejudice, the same inequality, the same structural inequality uh, that you had before. But 
exacerbated by the fact that you've served your country and, and given so much and you're slapped in the face by the inequality when you come back. So he was already, that, that analysis was already well in underway when he got this letter from Thich Nhat Hanh. I think what, what Thich Nhat Hanh did for King in this letter and in their friendship, in their relationship, is uh, help both of them live into what um, King called living in the world house and what uh, Thich Nhat Hanh called being a world citizen. So um, a big step in that path for King was receiving the 1964 um, Nobel Peace Prize. He actually said that he had a responsibility after receiving the Nobel Peace Prize to try to look at the whole world uh, instead of only at, at his work in, in uh, civil rights in the United States. Um, now, I think something that takes some work, and Vincent Harding really helped us with this, is to understand that it's a both and. <laughs> he doesn't abandon his work on civil rights. And that was what you know critics said at the time, white and black, was that you're turning your back on your primary work and your wide, you know, that was not the case. He was contextualizing that work in the global context. And I think uh, Thich Nhat Hanh helped him do that uh, tremendously. So helpful. And let me um, pick up on that in terms of the April 4th, 1967 speech. Um, and we saw in the chat, one of our uh, audience members today highlighted the fact that the California Poor People's Campaign will be doing readings. Um, there is a national coalition of groups, a Fellowship of Reconciliation, and uh, working with the National Council of Elders, of which Dr. Vincent Harding was one of the co-founders, um, and others to encourage communities to host community readings of Beyond Vietnam, A Time to Break Silence. Uh, I am hopefully helping to coordinate one here in Asheville this April. Um, we invite all of you to do so. That's um, wonderful. Put into the chat a way that you can learn more about it. You can watch a video of last year's national reading by many famous people and all that kind of thing, but you can do it in your community. And it's really, as you're saying, uh, Mark, uh, a great way to engage those those intersections and those interconnections. Uh, it's an incredible document. Um, and as Ruby Sale said to me <laughs> last year, um, I said something about uh, that as a, as a speech. And she said, Mark, Martin didn't give speeches. He mm. gave sermons. <laughs> so I've revised my language around that. It, yeah, it was a sermon. It was at Riverside Church. Riverside Church. That's and, right. and Vincent, of course, wrote the first draft <laughs> of, of that speech. And it was Absolutely. clergy and laity concerned, right, uh, yeah. against Vietnam. Exactly. So, yeah, and uh, we always honor, as you say, Dr. Harding as the, the, the first person to, to shape some of that language that, again, Dr. King had been working with. And we also really always must lift up Coretta's own life and legacy because she was, again, pushing her husband and pushing so many uh, around uh, that piece as well. Um so uh, there's a couple more questions on the chat here, and I think then we'll maybe move to, I'll, I'll, I'll have maybe one final um, question for you, um, uh, Bishop Mark. Um, we have here from Jack Farrell, what were the reasons the South Vietnam government violently repressed, repressed Buddhists? Um, and you do write about this, uh, I think, and also from Daniel Barron, didn't uh, Reverend Dr. King describe the beloved community as a place where we love across differences. Yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, I'll start there. The, um, the idea of their friendship, um, just as the beloved community can manifest inside you, um, in your own self, um, so it is that if you cross a, a boundary and make a friend across a, a distance, the whole of the beloved community is manifest in that moment. That's one quality of the beloved community, is that where, um, <laughs> in uh, Christian terms, wherever two or three are gathered, uh, there you are in the midst of us, the, the wholeness of Christ is present in just the meeting of two people. Uh, so when, when you think about um, crossing a boundary, the boundaries of Buddhism to Christianity, of the United States to Vietnam during a war, of a monk to a Christian married person, I mean, you know, all these huge uh, barriers. And then 
when when I hear that they came together, doesn't it just lighten up the space around us? We feel that. And it opens the possibility that that could be true for me, for me as well, um, and for us, that uh, these seemingly insurmountable uh, barriers. So we had a lay missionary from the Diocese of California um, in um, in Brazil, and he used to quote the, the Quaker saying that if you move towards a barrier, it can dissolve. So if you can move towards the barrier, so, so many of us see the barrier and we just go, well, that's that. Uh, you know, I can't talk with that person. That's over. They voted for Trump. That's it. Um, and, you know, our family has changed. Uh, we now have these people aligned over here and these over here. And um, but if if you'll take the, the, the hope that if you move towards the barrier, it can dissolve um, then. And then what's on the other side of that dissolution It's the beloved community. So that's the work of reconciliation. Yeah. Um, so the first part was the um, the repression. So politics are never removed from from religion, right? Uh, when when people tell um, ministers to they've gone from preaching to meddling, what they mean is that that's just inconvenient, right? Um, uh, you cannot remove human life from politics. It comes from the polis, back to, back to Aristotle, Socrates, Plato. It doesn't mean just an urban space. It means that, as Aristotle said, we are social animals. We live in a social context. So the polis stands for our social life. And the ordering of that life is our business. You know, that, that is our business. Um, we are supposed to be doing that. Uh, so there is no apolitical space, and anybody that tells ministers or any of you to stop talking because uh, that that is moving outside your remit as a person of faith is just they're just telling you to be quiet because uh, they don't want you to do that. Um, so okay, that you know that all of you know that, um, but that's what's bound up in this suppression of Buddhists in um, in South Vietnam. The the occasion was Wesak, the uh, birthday of the Buddha, and it's a big big festival. And there's a a, a lot of public um, uh, ceremony around the birthday of the Buddha. And the president of South Vietnam was worried about social unrest that that it would it would move from the religious into the political protest, uh, because there was uh, a, a great deal of um, political repression to prosecute the war uh, with the North. And um, so that that was it. I mean, it, it was just a simple kind of um, the, the way the way tyranny is simple, um, simple explanation. Thank you. Um, there are more uh, questions coming in, but uh, I know that We've been together for a while. Can can I take one more off the chat and then uh, offer my final one? Great, thank you, Mark. Um, so uh, Carol Bragg, uh, um, who's a great scholar of of King uh, herself, thank you for your writings, Carol, and your your teachings. Asks, what are the possibilities for dialogue with evangelical Christians around agape love and the beloved community? You know, that's such a good question. And, you know, I preach uh, things that I don't necessarily live out myself. <laughs> and um, this is hard. Um, you know, it's hard, these relationships. Um, but I do believe what I'm saying. And so I have attempted to have those conversations with evangelicals uh, at various points in the past and ongoing. And Agape is a good place to meet people uh, because uh, evangelical Christians overall, um, sometimes represent uh, closer, let's just put it this way, closer readings of the scriptures than people in my tradition. <laughs> um, when I was a, a young seminarian in my first semester of Greek, um, one, I, I gave some answer from the Gospel of John, which is easy Greek, as you know, and um, one of my classmates, a dear friend, raised his hand and said, how is it marked got that right. And uh, Tony, why is he so good at Greek? And Tony said, I'm not sure he is good at Greek. He was raised a Methodist. He probably read the Bible more than most of us. <laughs> so I just knew the stories and I was kind of filling it in. That was probably true. 
So evangelicals know this material. They, they do know this material. And every time Jesus says love, 90, 99% of the time Jesus says the word love, translated, it's agape love. It's not philia. It's not eros. It's not storge. It's agape. It's so central to everything that Jesus said. Um, if, if you follow in the liturgical readings of the Roman Catholic Church, the Orthodox Church, the Methodists, the Anglicans, um, we had the um, baptism of Jesus on the first Sunday after the Epiphany. And um, in that, the heavens open, Jesus is baptized, uh, and he sees, he's praying. He sees the Holy Spirit coming down upon him as a dove, and he hears a voice say, this is my agape son. That's what it literally says. Beloved is, so what does that mean? Well, it means that God's love for you and for Jesus is overflowing, unconditional, and sacrificial, all these ways that we interpret agape. It's, it's, so, it's, so evangelicals know this, and uh, it's a, I would say that was Carol who said, asked this question. I think it's a good place to start. It doesn't erase all the difficulties of conversation, but I think that it's so central um, that people can meet there. Thank you. Um, I, boy, I, I have many more questions myself. I mean, I would love to hear more about your time in Hue. I mean, what a what an extraordinary privilege for you that you referenced just briefly about having the opportunity to go and be in the monastic yeah, community that there. That's incredible. Uh, just, you know, and short, so shortly before pandemic begins too, right? So yeah. for for you to have been able to make that pilgrimage into that place. I think I just want to close with this. You offer us at the close of the book, an invitation um, mm -hmm. to uh, consider something that you're calling beloved community circles. Now, uh, many of us use this language in different ways. We've talked about it in terms of the richness of it, the legacy of it. Here in Asheville, we have beloved Asheville, and we have beloved community center in Greensboro and yeah. all that. But what is your vision of beloved community circles? What is the invitation you would like to extend to everyone? Thank you, Ethan. Um, so the possibility that Thich Nhat Hanh has offered to us by opening the lineage up to all of us is uh, to live even further into the beloved community than he was able to do. So his communities are Buddhist communities. Uh, his communities are Buddhist communities. So when he talks about the Sangha, he's talking about uh, practicing Buddhists. And they are in the Plum Village communities and so on. This is beautiful. But what would the next step be? So that's what we have to ask ourselves. What's the, if he's handing this to us, what can we reveal given our place in time about the beloved community that, that those who came before us, uh, Ty, Martin, Howard, AJ, Josiah, all those people that they didn't see because of their historical placement. And I think this is the possibility of creating circles that are interfaith and even secular in deep partnership with each other. And so I suggest that they would have uh, some components. They would be deliberately diverse based on the um, freedom circles from the, fellow, the uh, Church of the Savior in Washington, DC. Uh, so they would be deliberately diverse from the beginning. If you create an all white boys school in uh, Episcopal boys school in Virginia, that's a boarding school, and you want to change it, I can tell you this from you know experience, it's hard to change once, it, could I put it this way, the DNA of an organization has been set, it's harder to change it. So you, you create a diverse community from the beginning. You seek out diversity and you invite into this circle um, diverse folks. And then you also have spiritual practice. So both King and Thich Nhat Hanh stayed what they were, um, Buddhist and Christian. And I think you should. I mean, that's what I should do is continue to pray. I should continue to take part in the Christian sacraments. This is my life. But I should honor the spiritual practices of those in the circle with me. So we might spend 20 minutes, as um, Thomas Keating recommended with uh, Centering Prayer, in the circle together, this diverse circle, quietly. I might be using the Jesus Prayer, and you might be using Thich Nhat Hanh's methods of mindfulness, but we're both practicing. 
in the same space in the same time, or at least we both honor our practices outside of that asynchronously. And then we unite for the maintenance of the beloved community. So what would that look like? It could be environmental work. It could be race work. It could be poverty work. It could be gender equality work. It could be the LGBTQ community. I didn't write about this in the book, uh, but I think for the Southeast Asian Buddhist communities, the LGBTQ work is, is a big area that they, they just haven't gotten there yet. They haven't done that um, overall. And uh, so, yeah, so um, we, and, and you don't, one of the things I've noticed in the climate work <laughs> is that when I go to these UN climate uh, summits is that very earnest people come and they wanna talk to me about uh, their idea about how to save the planet. And they're, almost all of them say the same thing. If, if everyone would just do this, whatever this is, we would solve the planet problem. This is not the case, right? <laughs> and, and A, that's never going to work because we have different commitments. And back to wonder and the experience of what we love, we will protect. All of us have a place that wonder has led us, that love has led us. So let's honor that, but let's communicate with each other and support each other. So I may be mostly working in the climate space, but I want to know if this is the work of intersectionality. Um, I want to know what you're doing on race. And then we might find the places where those connect and we might advocate with those together. So uh, I don't know if that seems concrete enough, but the idea is simply start with a very small group, honor your spiritual practices, follow your heart and communicate. Beautiful, beautiful. And certainly for our legacy as the Fellowship of Reconciliation, that could be not any more uh, possibly uh, consistent and aligned with, as you know, our historic mission um, for more than a century. Um, Mark, this has been such a joy uh, to spend this time in conversation with you and with this really wonderful. beloved community here. Let me offer just a couple quick announcements before you offer us with a closing prayer, if that's okay. Um, we are, again, just so uh, privileged and grateful to all of you who've spent this time together with us for um, the conversation about Brothers in the Beloved Community. I have put into the chat, again, a way that you can purchase the book if you don't yet have a copy for a discount from Parallax Press, the publisher, 30% um, discount. So just go to their website, get it there using the discount code M-A-R-C-3-0, Mark 30, Mark with a C, 30, um, and, uh, and, um, or purchase it from your local independent bookseller. Um, um, so, and, uh, and you know, you all know that Parallax was founded by Ty. That's right. Thank you. Yeah, she's lovely. Right. Um, so that's first and foremost. Um, we'll be uh, hosting a number uh, of other book events in the coming weeks and months. Uh, I'll be hosting many of them and um, invite you to join me to, to follow us online through our various social media channels or sign up for our e-newsletter. Um, some of the books we are planning to um, host in the next uh, three months are uh, Reverend Dr. Obrey Hendricks for his uh, new book, Christians Against Christianity. Um, hopefully that'll be coming up in the next few weeks. Um, Eric Corson for Reaching Beyond Prison Walls, and someone uh, I'm just getting to know named Rima Vesley Flad for a conversation about uh, her forthcoming book, um, Black Buddhists and the Black Radical Tradition. So um, please do come back, everyone, for those and, and more that are coming up. Um, and um, uh, also next week, um, and again, what a blessing, uh, June Keener Wink, to have you here in the circle with us today, June. Always uh, beautiful to see you. Um, uh, June um, and her family are behind FOR's launch of the Walter Wink and June Keener Wink Fellowship um, last year. And next week, we'll be kicking off through, through our first Wink Fellow, Dr. Fernando Ona, a five-month monthly uh, book uh, club series about Wink's The Powers That Be. So um, Bishop Mark, you spoke so powerfully uh, to Walter's writings and teachings, and we're excited for that. So it's Thursday, January 27th, 
uh, at seven o'clock Eastern time, four o'clock Pacific time. Um, and uh, here's a link to um, register for that series. You can come to one or you can come to all five. Um, you're most welcome. And it'll be a very participatory um, conversation, uh, really uh, a lot of it done in small groups and small group conversation. So please do consider joining us next Thursday and every last Thursday of the month thereafter through May. Um, and uh, um, I've already shared about the King and Breaking Silence. And um, the last thing I think I wanted to make sure everybody knows about, hopefully all of you have seen um, the release this past week of um, uh, drawing on our 1957 comic book, Martin Luther King and the Montgomery Story, um, which again, um, there's such a lineage. Last week, we, re we released 60 pages of new materials to accentuate a deep in the conversation about this extraordinary 16-page um, comic book from 1957, but looking at it in new critical ways um, through many, many eyes and lots of exercises for middle school, high school, and uh, people of all ages. And you can download all of those materials from our website for free um, from uh, just using this link, which is... Um, uh, I'll be putting in the chat now as well. So it's just a, it's a bit.ly short link, or you can just go to FORUSA's website, which is forusa.org, and you'll find it uh, very easily there to get all of those different PDF downloads. So um, um, lastly, again, one more time, buy the book. Please do support <laughs> Mark, support Parallax, and um, support this really um, beautiful story. Bishop Mark, thank you again so much. What a what a joy it's been for me it's to spend this time. It's been a tremendous joy. Would you like me to pray this prayer of Howard Thurman's? That would be a, a, a blessing and a delight. Okay. Let's see. Let me pull it up here. Thank you all for taking in part in this. I really loved it, and I, I'm so grateful to each of you. Let us pray. Open unto me light from my darkness. Open unto me courage for my fear. Open unto me hope for my despair. Open unto me peace for my turmoil. Open unto me joy for my sorrow. Open unto me strength for my weakness. Open unto me wisdom for my confusion. Open unto me forgiveness for my sins. Open unto me love for my hates. Open unto me thyself for myself. Lord, Lord, open unto me. Amen. Have a wonderful evening, afternoon. Um, it's, it's such a privilege to be with each of you.